Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, this week we're doing B4.1, which is Adaptation to Environment in IB Biology. So, starting off with the habitat. What's the habitat? The habitat is the place where an organism or a population or a species or a community lives, and that's important, okay? Uh, and it can mean both the geographical location as well as the type of place, the type of ecosystem. That's uh, also the physical conditions, where within the ecosystem. So you could say, for example, that the ibex lives in an alpine habitat. So that could be the Italian Alps, for example. But then it's also at very high altitude on sites that are often snow covered and with little competition from other animals. So there's a lot to say about any habitat. Moving on, so the non-living things in an organism's environment are called abiotic factors. So all organisms are adapted to the abiotic environment. The abiotic environment determines a lot about the habitat. So let's start with lime grass. So lime grass is on sand dunes. So the issues it faces us are water conservation and it has to tolerate high salt concentrations and sand accumulation. So what does it do for that? Well, it has a thick waxy cuticle on its leaves to reduce transpiration, meaning less air uh, will leave and less water as well. Two, it has stomata in indentations. So they're kind of folded in to maintain humid air and reduce transpiration rates. It has leaves that roll up during droughts. It also has underground stems that grow upwards as sand accumulates and also extend deep into the dune to obtain water. And it has accumulation of carbs in the root to increase water uptake by osmosis. So make sure to note all of those down. There's a lot there. Um, and then we have mangrove trees. So here the challenges are that they live in waterlogged anaerobic soils, so little air, and with high salt concentrations because the water uh, from the sea often floods them. So what do they do? Well, they secrete excess salt from glands in the leaves. They also have roots covered in cork, which reduces salt permeability. They have cable roots, which grow close to the soil surface because uh, there's more oxygen there. They have these vertical root branches that you can see here, which grow up into the air and absorb oxygen. They also have large floating seeds, which can be carried by the ocean, um, and they accumulate minerals in their roots, increasing the osmotic potential to make more water go in, because again, there's these waterlogged soils. So different adaptations to different habitats. Makes sense, right? Great. So all of these abiotic factors that I mentioned affect where a species can live. So for plants, geographic distributions are determined by the temperature, the water availability, the light intensity, the soil pH, the salinity, and the availability of nutrients. That makes sense. Um, and a plant cannot live outside its range of tolerance for these factors. So the range of tolerance is an important concept, right? Um, we all have a range of tolerance for some factors. So in the case of animals, by the way, it's only temperature and water availability. The others don't affect us. Um, but even for humans, we have a range of temperature that we can tolerate. That's our range of tolerance. And outside that, we cannot live. So for example, as you can see here, penguins uh, have a range of tolerance that means that they can only live in these areas covered in blue in our planet. Great. So following on from that, well, we're going to look at coral reefs. So coral reefs are marine ecosystems which can only develop where conditions are suitable for hard corals to form. So they need to be within this range of tolerance. Uh, some factors that affect it are depth, so it has to be less than 50 meters deep so that light can penetrate through. The pH has to be above 7.8 to allow calcium carbonate deposition in the skeleton. The salinity needs to be between 32 and 42 parts per thousand of dissolved ions. It has to be clear, so turbidity uh, would prevent light penetration and they need light. And the temperature needs to be between 23 and 29 degrees. So this is just a good example of how an ecosystem can only form, in this case coral reefs, under certain conditions, under certain ranges, right? It's not uh, too specific, but it's always a range. Amazing. So a biome, what's a biome? A biome is a group of ecosystems uh, which are similar to each other. And this is because they have similar abiotic conditions. Remember, abiotic factors are the non-living things, right? So rocks, water, etc. So because they have similar abiotic conditions and they're very similar, they're going to have similar communities, similar organisms living in them. Um, 
Therefore, plants and animals are going to evolve similar adaptations in response to the conditions, which is an example of convergent evolution. So, for example, in this case, I put these two examples. They both have a lot of adipose tissue to um, maintain heat, right? Because they live in a very similar environment. So that's just a good example of how plants and animals that might come from different evolutionary origins are going to adapt similar functions to live in the same habitat. Great, so continuing with this concept of biomes, so biomes are distributed mainly as determined by two abiotic factors, which is temperature and rainfall. So as I mentioned, a biome is a, a group of ecosystems which are of a specific type, they're very similar to one another. And you can find the most likely ecosystem that will happen given any combination of precipitation, that is uh, rainfall and temperature. So this graph, be aware of it because you might be asked some questions spe specifically in paper two. Great, so now let's look at some adaptations that animals and plants have to different biomes. So first we're going to look at hot deserts. So hot deserts have very high temperatures during the day and very cold temperatures at night. Rainfall here is very, very low and there's little organic matter in soil. So first, by looking at the saguaro, the saguaro is a cactus which is adapted by having wide spreading roots. That makes sense to get the little water there is. It also has deep tap roots, again, to get more water. It has fat stems, as you can see here, to conserve water. A thick, waxy cuticle um, to reduce transpiration in the leaves. And the leaves, as you can see, are spines, uh, which, again, reduces surface area for transpiration. Then we have the fennec fox here. Um, and the fennec fox is nocturnal to avoid the highest temperatures. It also builds underground dens to stay cool during the day. It has long, thick hair for insulation. And it can change its ventilation rate, so it has a very variable ventilation rate, which can be used to cause heat loss by evaporation during the really, really high temperatures. Great. And now if we look at tropical rainforests, they have high temperatures, high precipitation, and very high light intensity. So first we're going to look at the Maranti, so that's a tree which is adapted to rainforests. Uh, the adaptations are that they grow to over 100 meters high to compete for light because there's a lot of trees in the rainforest. They have a smooth trunk allowing to shed rainwater very rapidly. Their leaves, you can't see here, but they're oval and they have pointed tips to shed water very rapidly. And the leaves are also evergreen, taking advantage of the light all year round to do photosynthesis. And then here we have the spider monkey. So uh, they have long arms and legs to climb, flexible shoulders to allow swinging between trees, a long tail that can grip onto branches, and they also breed all year round as there is a constant supply of nutrients, um, that is food. So take some of these in, right? write some of them down. You don't need to memorize all of them, but you just need to understand that animals and plants are adapted to their biome, and remember that's through convergent evolution as well, um, and remember some of these characteristics. So now here are some paper one questions uh, to look at. So first, Arctic moss lives in the tundra. Identify two abiotic factors acting on Arctic moss in this habitat. Um, I'll leave you three seconds to think, um, so you can pause here, but in three, two, and one. You could have said any of these, right? You need to say two for the answer to be uh, to get full marks, but uh, this was in the slide, right? It's just, if you go back, you'll see it's really clear that you just need to copy and paste. Uh, you just need to remember, okay? Um, then, how does the shape of a desert lizard's body help it survive in hot environments? Again, three, two, and one. It's um, B and C. Sorry, I should have pointed to D. The answer is D, right? It's both B and C. How come? Okay. Increasing water loss would not help it in hot environments. Instead, it should do the opposite, right? Uh, but reflecting sunlight is a way to lower body temperature and increasing surface area for cooling is also a very smart idea because um, cooling the heat from the inner body needs a surface area to diffuse out of. So a higher surface area allows for more cooling. So that makes sense. Uh, if you have any questions, again, drop them in the comments, but we're moving on now. And finally, the final question, which is, which of the following statements about adaptations to abiotic factors is correct? Now, these are longer, so I'm going to take you, I'm going to give you some time to think, pause now, um, and I'm going to count down to three again. So, three, two, and one. And the answer is C. Okay, how come? Well, A, so attracting the predators, that's not an abiotic factor that's living, right? Uh, so that doesn't make sense. I mean, it's not necessarily wrong, 
but it's just not an adaptation to an abiotic factor. Then, increasing water vapor concentration gradient between leaves and air would only increase transpiration, leading to more water loss, so that doesn't make sense either. And then D, mangroves do not absorb oxygen from stomata. They do so through specialized uh, structures in their roots. So again, that's just not true. Therefore, the real answer is C, which is that they're adapted to survive in an environment with limited freshwater availability. Because remember, the sea floods constantly. So um, maybe you have to go back to that slide to listen, but that's the answer. I hope everything was clear in this topic. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And until then, I'll see you next week for the next topic.